Hello and welcome to our webinar, Breaking Stereotypes Through Children's Books. My name is Amanda Sullivan and I manage the national webinars here at the National Girls Collaborative Project. And I'm so thrilled that you've all joined here today for such an important and fun uh, webinar where we will learn about some great children's books and accompanying, accompanying excuse me, resources for your students, your children, and other youth that you serve. You will see my colleague Nancy Scales Connie in the chat. If you have any issues, um, need any tech support, you can send her a private message. Uh, auto transcripts have been enabled. If you have any issues with that, please feel free to shoot Nancy a message. And this is being recorded, so you will have access to this webinar recording as well as the chat transcript after the event is complete. Before we go in and introduce our amazing speakers who we have here today, I wanted to give a little bit of background about NGCP, who we are, what we do, in case you're joining us for the first time today. We are a national network of diverse stakeholders who are advancing the agenda in gender equity. We bring together organizations that are committed to informing and encouraging girls to consider STEM. As a network of networks, our reach is broad. The programs in our network serve 20 million girls. And because many of our programs also serve boys, we reach more than 12 million boys as well. NGCP has been transforming STEM for 20 years. And our vision really is simple at the heart of it. We hope to create STEM experiences that are as diverse as the world we live in. You can see our three essential goals on screen here. We believe that STEM skills can be acquired by anyone and fostered in everyone. Our initiatives build confidence and create a community of lifelong STEM activators. Through the power of collaboration, we spark curiosity and develop a passion for STEM. We share resources and solutions with a coalition of leaders and via our website, newsletters, online databases, social media, and webinars like this one. NGCP also strengthens the capacity of programs by sharing exemplary practices, research, and program models. When programs are stronger and more sustainable, girls and youth are better served. We distribute these resources in accessible ways, such as train the trainer programs and online platforms. And finally, we leverage our network of girls serving STEM programs, advocates, and youth so that together we can create the tipping point for gender equity in STEM. We're always doing a lot. We're very active. I wanted to share about a few of our current activities with their accompanying links and resources in case they're useful to any of you today. And as I'm sharing about them, Nancy will be putting links in the chat for you to check out. So we engage in activities both virtually and in person nationally, as well as through our local collaboratives. We partner with organizations to scale and deliver content such as the Leap Into Science National Network in partnership with the Franklin Institute and the Million Girl Moonshot in partnership with STEM Next and the Mott After School State Networks, serving hundreds of educators via local networks. Working with Lida Hill Philanthropies, NGCP manages the If Then Collection, a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women in STEM fields. These media are available at no cost. NGCP also hosts the Youth Advisory Board. The Youth Advisory Board helps to review and provide feedback on current NGCP initiatives, and they really are a guiding youth voice in the future direction of what we do at NGCP. Fab Femmes is an international database of female role models from many STEM fields. They are passionate about the work they do and ready to connect with programs to spark your students' interests. We'll put that link in the chat as well. And locally, our state collaborative leadership teams offer convenings, providing professional development, mini grants for innovative projects when funding is available, as well as distribute their own regular newsletters spotlighting local resources. We have webinars. You, you obviously know about our webinars because you're here today, but you might not know that we offer them pretty much every month on a variety of topics to help our networks grow and thrive. We bring authors like the ones we have today, as well as STEM professionals, researchers, educators, and more. So if you're interested in seeing some of our upcoming webinars and other online events, please check out the link we will put in the chat. It's on our events and announcements page. And the best way to hear about our new initiatives, our resources, um, our events is to sign up for our newsletter and that you'll be the first to know when we have something like this event coming up. 
Well, that was a lot, but I hope you got some valuable information about who we are, what we do, and why we do it. And now I'm absolutely thrilled to kickstart our webinar, Breaking Stereotypes Through Children's Books, and introduce you to the two amazing speakers that we have with us today. So today we're joined by Dr. DJ Cast and author Catherine Locke. Let me introduce them before turning it over to them to share their expertise. Dr. DJ Cast is the Director of STEM Education Programs for the University of Southern California's Joint Educational Project, which includes managing the Young Scientists Program. She has provided STEM education instruction to over 29,000 underserved students, 900 educators, 20 school principals, and countless community members. She holds a doctorate in education focusing on teacher education in multicultural societies in STEM at USC. She received her master's degree in education and biology teaching credential from the USC Rossier School of Education. And she received her bachelor's degree in biology and a master of science in marine environmental biology in 2011 from USC. She has coordinated the creation and publication of a steam powered career children's book series that features main characters of color and scientists of color for elementary school students. We'll be hearing all about that today. Her education philosophy is focused on hands-on, inquiry-based, and authentic STEM learning experiences. Her mission is to level the playing field for underserved students in STEM, and her work makes an impactful difference by leveling the playing field in STEM for low-income students of color in the Los Angeles area. Welcome, DJ Cast. We're also joined by Catherine Locke. Catherine Locke lives and writes in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with their feline overlords and their addiction to chai lattes. They are the author of the critically acclaimed This Rebel Heart, The Girl with the Red Balloon, a 2018 Sydney Taylor honor book, and a 2018 Carolyn W. Field honor book, as well as The Spy with the Red Balloon. They are the co-editor and contributor to This Is Our Rainbow, 16 stories of her him, them, and us, which has three star reviews and made Kirkus Review's best middle grade of 2021 list, as well as it's a whole spiel, love latkes and other Jewish stories. They also contributed to Unbroken, 13 stories starring disabled teens and Out Now, Where We Go Again. They are the author of picture books, Bedtime for Superheroes, What Are Your Words, a book about pronouns, and Being Friends with Dragons. Welcome, Catherine Locke. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. DJ Cast to get us started. DJ? Hey, everyone. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. DJ Cast, and I am the director of STEM education programs for USC's Joint Educational Project. And um, I, in my work, we run STEM education programs and Part of today, I do want to give you some context about both why our programs exist, some of the demographics of the community, the communities that we're serving, and just why the books that I'm going to be talking about were just so desperately needed. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, so in California, and so my my focus in my work is primarily in elementary education. So I'm I'm K five all the way. <laughs> And in California, more than 40% of elementary school teachers say that they've been spending an hour or less on science per week. And um, of teachers that we surveyed for some of our, like our publications, over 85% of them have reported not having any professional development in science for over three years. And so eventually elementary school teachers that are uncomfortable teaching science, especially in kindergarten through third grade, don't end up teaching it. Next slide. And so this causes a positive feedback loop for a lot of our students. If they're missing that science content in elementary in their K-3 classrooms, they tend not to do very well on the standardized testing in science that they have in the fourth and the fifth grade. And this kind of perpetuates and uh, in a lot of low income schools, at least here in California, they, there's a lack of access to AP level STEM classes at their schools, like wealthier districts have like 15 to 20 AP classes and a lot of low income schools have 
less than five and maybe one of them is a sci- a AP science. And, you know, again, with this positive feedback loop, kind of the systemic issue can then cause low-income students when if they if they have persisted through all of this K-12 science, still have a love and passion for science, when they get to college, it tends to, um, they, they feel underprepared. Um, and so they do tend to switch majors or drop out uh, of college altogether. Next slide. Um, so for the community that we serve with our STEM programs, um, it's about 84, per- and I, I, I think it's important to explain the context because it explains how and why we set up the books with the way we did. Um, so the population that we're serving is 84% Latinx, 10% Black, um, 93% low income, which we measured by free or reduced lunches. Um, 30% of our students are English language learners. And out of that 30%, almost all of our students are Spanish speaking and 90 or 97 approximately of our students um, are students of color. Next slide. And so to kind of address this need for both teachers and students to have STEM in their K-3 classrooms, we have three STEM programs within our university. We have the Young Scientist Program, which it's a free STEM program for teachers. It's directly in their classroom. We provide all of the hands-on science experiments, the curriculum, and an instructor that goes directly into their classrooms to teach the science. We also bring in scientists and we do teacher professional development. And all of our curriculum is grocery store based. So all of our materials are from the grocery store. So if students want to do the experiments with their families, the materials are accessible. Next slide. We also have some funding from um, a cancer research group, the, the Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. And some of the content that we have for their program is more medically focused. And um, we also have guest speakers from the like gamut. We don't just do researchers. We wanted to highlight lots of varying medicine options. So we have physical therapists, we've had cancer researchers, uh, lots of different um, scientists come in and talk to students. Next slide. So the the books were actually inspired by our Wonder Kids program because the way that our Wonder Kids program is set up is we focus on ologies or different STEM fields because there are bajillions of them. And so we try and focus on like six to 10 STEM fields every semester. We write hands-on curriculum introducing main content to those fields. And then we bring in a scientist to come in and talk because it's uh, focused on... um, the elementary level, we try and have it be interdisciplinary. So we have both science content, math, and literacy connection. So all of our books uh, or all of our lessons feature a children's book that goes with the lesson that we're talking about. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and we also, as much as we can, prioritize bringing in speakers of color since almost all of our students are also students of color. Uh, next slide. And it is really difficult to try and find science kids books that actually feature children of color as main characters of the books. Um, and the, so I, I put in so of why this is so difficult for us in the next few slides. Um, so this was in 2015 and I do have, I have 2015, 2018 and 2020. Um, in 2015, kids books were still 75% white main characters and then 12% non-human characters like animals, trucks, trains, etc. And that 14% uh, featured like non-white characters uh, as seen here. Uh, next slide. In 2018, it got a little bit better. Um, there's It's 50% white, but then the animal category has surprisingly shot up to 27%. And we're still only at 23% non-white identities uh, seen here. Next slide. Uh, and so again, we're in 2020 now, there is a decrease in, um, it's 41% white, again, an increase in the animals, um, but at least now at 27% white identities. And this is for all children's literature in general. And so trying to find niche science kids books that feature main characters of color is 
very difficult. Um, next slide. And so we we wanted to fix that. Um, and I would love to hear some of your opinions in the chat about how you would have approached this as well. But how would you so solve this problem of the lack of diversity in children's literature? And I wanted to give you all a minute to to respond in the chat if you would like. All right, not seeing any responses at the moment. I will head to the next slide and tell you about what we did. <laughs> yeah, so much of it is systemic. Uh, let's see, broader support for authors and illustrators of color, definitely. Um, making sure that people know about the books, perhaps if there's lists, love it, yes. Traditional publishing is very difficult to navigate and it's very expensive. Very true. Love it. Thank you all. Uh, so the way we did it is that we partnered with a nonprofit publisher called Room to Read. And part of their mission is to get books into um, book deserts. And surprisingly, I mean, uh, Los Angeles is actually a book desert. Um, and so we pitched them this STEM education series that you'll hear about in a minute. Um, and, and they loved the idea. And so what we did is, our next slide, I, I pressed it on my own computer. <laughs> Sorry, Amanda. Um, and so the what we did is that we um, had three main characters of color in the book series. So we have an Asian male character named Jay, a black female character named Cora, and a Latina female character named Mia. And each of them also have a corresponding animal friend that's here on the left. Um, next slide. And so someone also mentioned um, broader support for authors of color. We thought so too. And so we onboarded um, many authors of color for the series so that we also were diverse, not only in the animated characters that we were representing, but also, also in who was writing the books. And almost all of our scientists are also scientists of color. Um, the way that our books are set up, it's that the animated character uh, kind of explores the field of uh, in like very illustrated first half of the book. And then the second half of the book, um, we interview scientists that are actually like real life scientists that are in those fields. Because for us, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And so we really wanted to make sure that we had authors of color, we had scientists of color and the main characters of color just throughout our entire series. Um, and then next slide. And so these were the, the 10 books that we decided topic wise, part of which is who we were able to onboard scientist wise. Um, and also uh, we, so these are the 10 topics, data science, engineering, ga and gastroenterology, heart surgery, marine bio, VR, polar science, oncology, occupational therapy, and nanotechnology. And we, again, we set it up this way because Wonder Kids has that STEM fields model. And so these are books now that if we want to explore a certain STEM field, it is set up that way. So it has the, the content, it has the book. And then also all of this is, um, we have also matching lesson plans to all of these books as well. Uh, next slide. To answer Adrian's question, yes, because our community is 30% uh, English language learners and 98% Spanish speaking, our entire series is also available in Spanish, uh, as are all of the lesson plans uh, as well, are also all in Spanish. Uh, next slide. And as much as we could, we tried to match the character either to one of the authors or the scientists of the book. And so this is Stacy Finley. Uh, she is both the author and the scientist for our data science book. And so we matched her with Cora because we really wanted to, if, when students came to be able to actually get these books, we wanted them to meet some of our authors and scientists. And again, that representation is really crucial for our students. Um, our, the great questions, Adrian, the books are targeted to ages six to eight um, because of the, again, for Wonder Kids is it's where that main program is targeted for, but I think they can be used for 
Um, the links are, in, Nancy posted the links in the chat so you can kind of see uh, and see if you can use it for other grade levels as well. Um, next slide. And so there were, we tried to combat stereotypes in a lot of different ways throughout the books um, besides just having that representation throughout. Um, I think it, it's most evident in our marine biology book um, because in general cost is just a major barrier for a lot of low-income students um, and that to that effect swimming in general is just a gatekeeping barrier for the marine biology field um, because usually you have to pay for access to a pool or pay for someone to teach you how to swim and buying a bathing suit um, or floaties or sunscreen etc and um all of that costs money and would you rather put food on the table or you know learn how to swim so for a lot of our students that we work with they they don't have access to a pool and so for the marine biology book we wanted to do both sides of the spectrum we wanted to have a black female character that was swimming scuba diving exploring the ocean etc and on the flip side of that we also had an um a black female scientist who whose marine biology work didn't include swimming and so this is charnel charnel's work was all about drones and she like dr uh, flies her drones all over different ocean things and collects video data and processes it um and so we have we had both aspects of that uh within the marine biology book uh next slide um so the publisher again their their main mission was book deserts and they actually sent us 90,000 free copies of the book um and we were to distribute them through all of our stem education programs so all of our kids were able to take a home all 10 in either english or spanish um to add to their home libraries and um so next slide so here you can see some of our, our authors and scientists with their books in both English and in Spanish. Next slide. <laughs> um, what some of the book assemblies look like. This um, We chose a different book for every book assembly. Um, and so we did it at a school. Um, and so each book assembly had like four to 500 kits. Ooh, distribution was a lot of fun counting them all out. Um, so this is the oncology one. Uh, next slide. Uh, we it was during October and so everyone went trick-or-treating for books um, and so all the authors were around the room with their book and all the kids would walk with a of course branded bag um, walked around to all of the rooms and um, or sorry all the tables meeting the authors and scientists and then getting their books and then whatever theme it was for that book assembly um, the students would read that book with us as like a giant group um, next slide because we're in California and sometimes they don't have auditoriums that'll fit an entire school worth of kits, we had some outside. Um, so this is our book assembly at Vermont with 500 plus students uh, and their books outside with our polar author and scientist, Jocelyn. Um, and then this is Sean at Norwood reading his heart surgery book. Uh, next slide. Um, but yes, yeah, so all of the the books are available for free digitally. All of the lesson plans are for free. Both, both of them are in English and in Spanish. And we also did some video recordings of some of the scientists to also match with the book so that we could provide this full package for teachers. Next slide. That's, that's my spiel. Amanda, are you going to go to Catherine or should I introduce Catherine? <laughs> Catherine, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and we will hear from you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cast. Thanks, everyone. Um, DJ, that was amazing. Um, as I am sharing my screen and finding the PowerPoint application, um, I grew up at a school that, um, a Title I school where 46% of our um, population was Hispanic. I grew up in Kennett Square. I actually can, DJ, can you help me? Are you guys seeing the presentation? Are you seeing all my notes? I see your notes too. Okay. I, uh, let's say swap displays. Did that work? Yes. Great. 
Um, so that was, that was really amazing. I, I have to send the librarian back at my old school, um, the links because they could really use that. And I, that was really cool. Thank you very much for sharing that. That just incredible. So hi everyone. My name is Catherine Locke. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I put them in my name just to help everybody. And then I also have it helpfully attached to my name on this first slide. I, I know it can get confusing because in my picture I have long hair and my name is Catherine, but please use they, them where you can. I am the author of What Are Your Words, which is a book about pronouns. It's illustrated by Anne Pashier, whose pronouns are also they, them. So if I talk about Anne or they also go by Andy, um, you may hear me using they, them for the illustrator as well. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the making of this book, our goals with the book, why I'm excited to share it with you today, and then also provide you with some resources. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this book uh, just to start. So this is a picture book. I think that people are typically using it K through three, but I really think that it's a picture book for all ages. It is the story of Ari, who is the kid in the middle of the cover who's waving their hand. They are super excited that their uncle Lior is, who's their favorite uncle, is coming to visit the same day as their neighborhood barbecue. Uncle Lior is non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. They are also a gardener and a hat collector and a biologist. And this goes with the theme of the book, which is that people are more than just one part of their identity. And everyone has many facets of their identity and gender is one of them. So just diving into that a little bit more. Before I talk too much about the book, I thought it'd be important to introduce myself. I'm a Philadelphia area native. I grew up in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, mushroom capital of the world. I did work at a mushroom farm. Happy to talk about working at a mushroom farm. I now live in Philly, as you heard with my three cats. My cats are not dog loving cats. So despite my love for dogs, just a cat household. If you follow me on social media, you'll also see that I have a horse named Rory. She does not live in my condo. She lives in New Jersey. I am a lifelong writer and reader. I've been writing as long as I can remember. Uh, my mom has picture books that I dictated to her before I could write. They're basically fan fiction of my own life where my mom and I have a farm and I have no siblings. So I was retconning my own life from an early age. Uh, I am the oldest of three, so that's why. Books gave me a, a place to be safe when the world around me was not safe to be queer. So I grew up in a fairly, then a fairly rural part of Pennsylvania. Um, I did not know anybody who was queer when I was growing up, not one person. Um, the only understanding I had of queerness was the AIDS crisis. And uh, that was the only future that I saw for myself as somebody who was queer. Books also gave me the language to understand myself. It was first through young adult books that I understood uh, the language for my identity and then ultimately my, my sexuality and my gender identity. If I had discovered books that helped me understand myself sooner, I think I would have had an easier childhood and adolescence. It's one of the reasons I'm really, really passionate about queer literature for youth. Accessing books that help you understand yourself saves lives. Okay, What Are Your Words is, like I said, it's a picture book for all ages. It is the first and only picture book that I have ever written where I thought about the adults who would also be reading this. I think about adults when I'm writing my other picture books in that if an adult has to read this 700,000 times to their small child at night, um, does it read aloud okay? But with this book, I also thought, there are adults who are going to read this book and learn from it. And so what does that mean for the narrative when I'm shaping it? I actually didn't come up with the original premise of this book. Um, our editor, Regan Winter, approached me in February 2020 and asked if I'd be interested in writing a book about pronouns for Little Brown. Beyond that, she didn't have a storyline. So she was like, a book about pronouns, that's all we want. And everything else, Ari, Uncle Lior, the neighborhood, the, the narrative, that all came out of my own experience and imagination. Uh, I wrote this book in three weeks in March, 2020, which was quite a time to be on deadline. 
and a, quite a time to be writing a book about people coming together. So I was writing it going, I don't know if people are going to have neighborhood barbecues by the time this book comes out. I also based the neighborhood in my in the book on my own childhood neighborhood. So I grew up with a man named Charlie who had little brown dogs and a woman named Mrs. Bolton who had an orange cat. And there were people that we just called the people who live in the Ivy house and uh, the poodle house. So I put all of those people in the, the book. Um, again, just as a way of framing the story for myself, but also a way of giving my own childhood a little bit of warmth and welcoming that um, I don't think those neighbors would have known what I meant if I said, what are your words? What are your pronouns to them back in the 90s? Uh, it was fun to put those Easter eggs in. So this is a picture book for all ages. It's also, um, you'll see on the next slide, there are also many different words that show up in this. So Ari asks the people in the book, what are your words? And they reply with their pronouns. And they also reply with their occupation or what they like to do or a hobby. They reply with adjectives. There are many different ways to describe ourselves. So one of the things that I wanted to do with this book was to talk about how pronouns are just some of the words that we use to describe who we are. And everybody has pronouns. So I think something that's been lost in a national discourse is that um, pronouns are really just parts of speech. Everybody has pronouns. They're not just reserved for trans and non-binary people. So cis people have pronouns. If you have questions about any of these terms, I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A section. But pronouns are just part of who we are and everyone uses them. So you'll see on this page, these are, this is Ari, and Ari has many different ways of describing themselves throughout the book. Ari is what we might call a gender expansive kid or a gender fluid kid. Um, so sometimes they use she, her. Sometimes they use he, him. Sometimes they use am. So I wanted to include all of these, but also they are happy, they are creative, they're thoughtful, they're athletic, they're silly, they're sleepy, they're calm, and they're honest. They're a kid. And so all of these make up who Ari is. So when we came together with this book, the illustrator, my editor, my agent, and myself, we really talked much more deliberately about what the goals were for this book. We wanted it to be a gentle introduction to pronouns. We wanted it to be a start to learning. We didn't intend for it to ever be a comprehensive part of learning about pronouns. Ari also has queer adults in their life, which as I said, I didn't have queer adults in my life, but I thought it was really important for another reason. Other than Ari's sister, all the characters that Ari interacts with are adults because I wanted to help, I wanted to show kids how adults should be responding to these questions, but I also wanted to show adult readers how they could respond to these questions from kids. I wanted to have that modeling language in the book, not only for the child reader, but for the adult readers of the books. So I, I also didn't want it to be a book that was really aggressive, like a pronoun is really important. And if you misgender someone, you are the worst. That's pretty counterproductive, right? So I really wanted this to be a book that says, like, here's how to have this conversation. Here are the words that you can use. This is how to have a conversation with your kid, but this is also how to have a conversation with a stranger or someone that you meet and you're like, I don't know, how do I navigate this conversation? This is a way to model that conversation, um, not only for children, but for adults. So when I talk about this book, I often get a bunch of questions that aren't necessarily about the book, but are tangential. That's good. That's the purpose of this book. This book is designed and, and the purpose is to open a conversation. It opens doors, doesn't close them. So I'm very happy that this book does that. I wanted to just go through some of these questions here. Um, the number one question I get asked is, what if I mess up someone's pronouns? Like, what if Catherine, I call you she by accident? That's okay. All you say is, I'm so sorry, I apologize, I won't let it happen again. And then don't let it happen again. And sometimes it does, that's okay. But by just saying, I apologize, 
it won't happen again and then moving on it helps reduce the burden that might be on the trans non-binary person for accepting the apology or feeling like when you apologize like i'm so sorry it's so bad i can't believe i did that that makes it where we have to say it's okay but it's not okay so by just saying i apologize I won't let it happen again. It takes that burden off of the trans person to um, alleviate your feelings. So are kids ready for this? Overwhelmingly, yes. Uh, kids, kids are amazing. <laughs> Students are so cool. So um, one of the things I talk about a lot when I talk to adults about this who are like, I don't know, I don't think that my kids are ready for this. Kids already use non-binary pronouns. They'll say, when are they coming about the pizza delivery person, right? They already use a singular they. They know how to do that. We've been using a singular they for hundreds and hundreds of years, and kids have picked up on that. They also already have classmates, cousins, friends, the playground, all sorts of places who may be trans or non-binary. It's more common than you would think. Kids are also really good at learning. Every day, kids wake up and they go to school and they learn about something that they didn't know. They go; Their entire job is to learn new things. So kids are very open to new information. Adults, part of growing up apparently, is becoming tougher or, or it becomes harder to learn new things. So kids are very like, yes, this makes sense. A-M, that's a Z, 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 those are pronouns. I can understand that. Adults are, are really uh, struggle more with it than the kids do. So I would say kids are ready for it, but sometimes the adults need some time to come around to it. In the book, Ari is looking for what pronouns fit them that day. They settle on they, them, which is why I'm using they, them to refer to the character while I talk about them. Um, Ari changes pronouns because Ari is figuring out who they are and they are, like I said, gender expansive or gender fluid, either word would probably fit them. They're not one single gender. So different pronouns fit them in different times depending on how they feel. Um, the next question is, how do I use, read, share this book if I am uncomfortable? I get this question a lot. Like people are like, I don't know how I feel about this, but my kid brought this home from school. Read it, talk about it. You can talk about how like, you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have this, or I didn't know these words. What are things that you didn't know when you were younger? And have that conversation about how things change and how we all learn new things. It's okay for you to read this and not be ready to share it with your kid or for you to read it and not be ready to bring it into a classroom. It's the existence of the book does not require anybody to read it or share it. It's not an obligation. I want people to share it when they're ready to share it with kids. What if I don't know how to pronounce neo pronouns? Neo pronouns are new pronouns. I don't know if you can see me, but they're the um, like Zay, Zier are in the book. AM are in the book. If you are reading it aloud and you just need to take a guess, you can take a guess. All of them are on YouTube. They're also in pronouns.org, which is a link that I have on the next slide. So I'll share that with you as well. It's totally okay to not know um, how to pronounce some of these newer pronouns. And by newer, I mean, they've really been around for 50 to 60 years in most of these cases, but they may be new to you and that's okay. Some of them were new to me when I was writing the book. I'm scared to bring this book into my school right now. Help. I get this from teachers. And uh, my answer is very, very clearly that no one should risk their job um, to bring this book into the classroom. So if you feel like your school or your library is not going to be receptive to this book, please do not put your own job at risk. There are bigger organizations that are taking on this fight right now and letting them do that is, is their job. There are so many other ways that you can make your classroom or your library inclusive by um, asking kids what their pronouns are, respecting people's pronouns, talking about how people are different, using books where people appear different or um, have different abilities or having really diverse and inclusive uh, collections is also a way of making kids feel like 
their gender, no matter what it is, would be accepted, even if there's not a book that is explicitly about trans and non-binary experiences. And I'll take, I can't have the chat open while I'm presenting. I'm not quite as good as DJ at this. So I'll take questions at the end. I also wanted to provide some resources. I know these slides were not sent to the collaborative project ahead of time, but I'll make sure that they have them and that they can share them with anybody who wants them. LGBTQreads.com is a site, full disclosure, run by a friend of mine. Um, it's a really incredible site that keeps a database of all children's literature and a lot of adult literature um, that is queer and has and it organizes it by genre and then pairing. It also includes a ton of picture books in, and nonfiction. So great option there. Pen America, Family Equality, CBC Books, which was shared earlier, they did the graphic about um, diversity in children's books. They do a lot of those studies. American Library Association also keeps rainbow lists every year. That's a great place to find uh, more books for all ages. So they divide them up by picture book, middle grade, and young adult. Local librarians, librarians are doing the best work. I just love librarians. <laughs> uh, thank you so much if you're a librarian and you're here. I, I'm really grateful for all the work that you guys do. Um, they're really great resources as well. Same with your local independent booksellers. Independent booksellers have access to a lot of bookseller associations. They have access to a lot of knowledge. They get sent um, ARCs, advanced review copies all the time. Human Rights Campaign also keeps book lists um, and also has good resources for, I need to support a student or my kid just came out or my coworker just came out. Human Rights Campaign, um, Trevor Project. I think, oh, look, I have Human Rights Campaign on there twice. Um, those are really great places. Pronouns.org is also a really fantastic resource. It has resources for what happens if I mess up? How do I learn pronouns for somebody I've known for 20 years and they've just come out and they're transitioning and I need to retrain my brain? Um, they have a lot of really great resources there as well. We're gonna get to the Q&A section in a bit. I just wanted to kick it off here for those who needed a few things to ask me about. I'm listening to the Taylor Swift Midnight on repeat. Uh, the picture book I cannot stop thinking about is Nigel and the Moon by Antoine Eddy. I am going to Iceland in the middle of May. My cat's names are Cora Pilot. Oh, I put Pilot on there twice. Piglet is feeling very left out. Cora, Piglet, and Pilot. Uh, I drink chai lattes. And if you're looking for a recommendation for a book for adults about trans history and a personal memoir, um, Sarah McBride's Tomorrow Will Be Different is uh, that book just changed my world. And this is how you can find me. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, DJ. Thank you both for sharing not just a bit about your professional work, but why you're passionate about these topics, your personal stories of uh, why you do what you do in the communities that you're in. And I, I, I personally learned a lot and I can tell from the chat, people are learning a lot and they're having, they have a lot of questions, um, questions that are being sent to me individually and questions that are being put in the chat. So this is great. I'm really excited for everyone here to have a conversation with you both. So I'm going to start with one question that came into me earlier on. Um, this question is for DJ. You had mentioned um, when you were speaking that there are also lesson plans and maybe other resources that go along with your books. Can you let us know how to access them? Was this one of the links that was shared? Um, or what's the best way for educators to get their hands on those? Great question, Amanda. I believe Nancy will put the main link in the chat, uh, but I will also screen share to show you what that looks like. So this is the link that Nancy, Nancy will put in here. Um, the books are also accessible from here. So you can just click here and it'll bring you to the this book page. So you can see all 10 here. Um, if you scroll further down, uh, we have a little bit overview of like the book assemblies and how those went. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And if you scroll further down, down here, each of the lesson plans are with each book type. So here you have data science, the lesson plan in English, and then underneath the lesson plan in Spanish. And so all of those are here. 
Uh, I'm biased, so I'm going to show you the book that I wrote for <laughs> oncology uh, and the lesson plan. And so they are NGSS aligned, um, and we uh, we we're a very visual group, and so a lot of our lesson plans also include how to do it um, with some pictures. Uh, <laughs> I would recommend being careful for the gastroenterology one, though. We mimic digestion with a pantyhose, and uh, it, it it was hilariously disgusting. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so this is where all the, the lesson plan resources are on this particular page. Um, if you scroll a little further down, we do have interviews of the, the we have an animated character that's interviewing the different scientists for some of the different books. So also another added visual piece that you can add here. Um, and then if you click on each of the books, again, biased, I'm going to show you the cancer one. Um, and so you can just hit read story here and it's set up here. I can make this full screen. Can you still see it like that? Okay, good. And so um, you can just click through the pages digitally like this. And someone asked about storylines earlier. Um, so uh, this, you can kind of, we, uh, this is Felicia. Felicia has a human friend that has cancer, but doesn't know what that means. And Jay has a grandfather, <laughs> my dad, um, that is a cancer researcher. And uh, so he starts talking about oncology. What are some of the, the symptoms of cancer? Because uh, it can vary based on um, the type of cancer that you have. What is the science behind what's actually happening? Metastasis in a nutshell. So spreading from one place to the other in the body um treatment and we set it up this way because our we have a cancer curriculum that literally also has these same lesson plans um immunotherapy and then cancer or sorry cancer prevention is here so exercising healthy eating etc and then the second half of every book is kind of delving deeper into the field so what is oncology what does it mean and then interviewing the actual scientist that's in that field um, we wanted to kind of, scientists are generally put on a pedestal and they don't get seen for what their regular life looks like. And so we do have an interview of like, what, what do you look like as a human? Like, what do you do? So, um, following, uh, Catherine's cat train, um, DJ has a cat named Meemaw and, uh, drives a Vespa to work, likes to work out hikes with his dad. And then the second, uh, um, one is kind of what do you do for your work? And so delving deeper of like, I do, this is how I do my research. <clears throat> uh, what are some like careers? What is the future of our field? What are some um, jobs in uh, the field that's being mentioned? And then uh, there are bolded words throughout the book. So there are like a vocabulary word list um, for teachers as well. Um, but yeah, so that's the English one. And then the Spanish one is here and it runs the same way. Thank you so much. I know I can speak for myself. I love fabulously disgusting uh, science projects. And I think most kids do too. And thank you for walking through all of those resources. I agree. It's so important when you're thinking about these scientists as role models or people that these kids are going to look up to, that it's not just about their job. What makes them a well-rounded person? What are their hobbies? What makes them a real person that you can connect with and look up to? So what an excellent resource. I'm really excited about that. Catherine, we got a similar question for you. I think you might have just answered it in the chat, um, but it was a question about whether there are any curricular or educator resources around um, what are your words or maybe any of your other picture books that you have uh, out. Yeah, so there are no curricular cur curriculum resources that I'm aware of. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Uh, for those familiar with traditional publishing, author is the last to know in most cases. So um, that doesn't mean they don't exist. So I did just send an email to my publisher um, to see if they had anything that I can share, but I am not aware of anything. My other two picture books are very, uh, they're, they're not really classroom books. So there isn't a curriculum for them. One of them is a like a bedtime routine book. So there's not really a uh, curriculum around that. All of the curriculum 
classroom things are for my older books. Got it. Thank you. Well, at NGCP, if you've been to some of our other events, you know we're all about collaboration and brainstorming and creating, building off others' resources. So perhaps if there's anyone here today that is so inspired to create an educator plan or a discussion, uh, I could see someone coming up with like a discussion prompt that educators could have with kids or parents could have with kids after um, reading that book. I know um, for myself, it prompted me to chat with my kids and ask them what are your words what do you what do you think about this so um feel free to volunteer in the chat if you are interested in creating such a resource we got another question Catherine that I think you you somewhat touched on already in the commonly asked questions that you get but just in case that you have any other two cents you want to put in do you have any suggestions for librarians who would love to purchase books like yours for their libraries? Um, books that are, um, but they fear repercussion from admin and parents. I know you touched on this, but is there anything else, any other words for some of the librarians here who, who want to have work like yours in their libraries? It's tough. I don't have a lot of great options for people. Um, it depends there's so many factors. Like if you're worried about parents, but your administration is supportive, there's the option of like talking to your administration. Like, is there a way that we can find a middle ground where people can sign these out with parent permission, which isn't the greatest option, right? Because we have kids who can't take these home or don't wanna ask their parents for safety reasons, but is there a middle ground? If your administration and your school board and your parents are all going to be a problem, I don't know how to get the, these books, not just mine, but other books into your collections right now. Um, I would really recommend reaching out to groups like PEN America and We Need Diverse Books that are both doing work to um, support teachers and educators and librarians in these areas where this movement is, is happening. So I would, I would encourage you to network and kind of help be part of an alliance because there's safety in numbers in that way. Um, and that's, that's the best advice I have. It's, you're in a really tough spot and I really, really feel for you. Um, and I'm very sorry that you were put in this position. Um, and I wish I had more advice on how to how to get these books in. Well, I think that that's a uh, useful starting ground um, and is still useful advice for all of us. Um, we just have a few more minutes for questions. Uh, DJ and Catherine have been answering a lot of questions in the chat, and we will put the chat transcript um, up with our recording and all the slides. So if you missed some of the answers uh, to questions that you had, go through the chat and you'll and you might see them. But even though this was addressed, I, I'm going to combine a few people's questions. A lot of people are asking DJ to learn more about uh, how the writers were recruited, how the scientists were recruited, what kind of background did they have in, in writing before this process? Um, how did they collaborate? I think people are just really uh, curious about what that process was like actually developing the books. And I know you touched on it a bit in the chat, but in case anyone's not reading the chat, um, do you wanna share a, a, a little bit about that? For sure. Um, so Room to Read um, also really uh, wants to showcase and support first time authors of color. Um, and so it was actually one of my students that had been recruited by them to write a book for their peace and equality series. Her name's Jocelyn. Uh, she posted about it on, on social media and I was like, I, I need to know everything about how you did this. <laughs> like, how did, how did you contact this publisher? Like, how did you, how did you make this children's book? Cause I I've had a running list of books we've needed for our STEM programs that just didn't exist. Um, and so she she told me all about how that worked and then she and I uh, pitched it to the publisher and they agreed and then fully funded it um and so in terms of recruitment it was heavily based around our university so there's a decent amount of bias um they're mostly uh most of our authors were also other educators that run programs not just STEM programs there were literacy programs like but they run programs for students of color. And so that way we had other avenues for distributing more of the 90,000 that came our way. 
Um, and then almost all, not 100% of them, but almost all of our scientists are also either a, like scientists that had worked with our program and done outreach through us or were hoping to do so, etc. cetera. Um, and so it was mostly connected through our STEM programs or and so that we could continue and kind of make it a package deal for future STEM, STEM programming. Thank you. I know I asked you a big question to answer in about two minutes, but that's really interesting to hear uh, the process of how the books were actually written and how everyone collaborated and were recruited. Well, I know we all have more questions. I know they're still coming. And thank you to Nancy for putting all the NGCP social media in the chat because we encourage you to keep the conversation going, keep asking questions, keep sharing your ideas. And we would love to hear from you. Were you inspired by our speakers today? Um, how are you going to put this into action? Is there one of the books that you're gonna pick up for your own kids or for your students? Are you gonna implement one of these lesson plans that you heard Dr. Cass talk about? Um, let us know in the chat, let us know on social media, and let us know when you actually implement. We'd love to reshare um, your content so more people can be motivated and get ideas. Thank you so much to our two speakers, Dr. DJ Cask and Catherine Locke for sharing your stories, your journeys, and your incredible resources with all of us. If you enjoyed this webinar, we hope you'll consider supporting the work of NGCP. Nancy had already put a link in the chat of how you can do that. We hope you'll come to our next NGCP event, which is all about learning to be an ally to girls and women in STEM. And we will have a post-webinar survey pop up. So we hope you'll take a couple minutes to complete that survey because it really does guide the speakers, the topics that we explore, and the resources that we share. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for the excellent questions and conversations in the chat. We hope to see you at our next event, and I hope you all take care. Thank you so much.